Hello everyone, uh, welcome to your first presentation on clinical infections. So this is taken into account the therapeutic aspects of your course. Um, the idea of this workshop is that you know, listen to this and watch the slides before you come to your therapeutic workshops which are in at the end of November. Um, so clinical infections, what's it all about? What you need to remember is if you look around the room where you are at the moment, you're probably sat in front of the computer. The surroundings may be relaxed, they may be quiet, could be noisy with people going out. Either way, there's a constant battle going on right in front of your eyes. A battle for survival on the palm of your hand. The only thing is, is that you can't see it. Okay, there's billions of microorganisms in the room that you're in, generally going around the business, not causing any problems at all. They want to survive just as much as you do. They want to, you know, reproduce. They want to um, have respiratory processes just as much as you are. And normally, most of the time, we're in a happy, peaceful situation. Um, there's plenty of commensal flora that live on your skin and they, you know, do really good jobs like eat your dead skin cells and make actually help with the washing process, the natural replication and washing process of the skin. All right, you've got plenty of commensal flora inside your intestines. If you didn't have them there, you get diarrhea, you get encephalitis and go mad, okay, because those bacteria, they absorb water in your large intestine, they also absorb nitrogen in your large intestine get too much of that circling around your blood, you start to shake, and you get all the signs of advanced liver disease. We don't want that to happen, okay? The only problem is, is when the microorganisms, sometimes they can get to places where you don't want them to, and that's an infection, okay? Your body's got a lot of natural defenses to infections, so you've got your natural killer cells, your neutrophils, that phagocytose any invaders and then you've got your acquired immune response that involves your T cells, B cells, antibodies. Um, that's all very good if it works. Okay, but as a pharmacist you're going to have to know a little bit more about what's going on and this constant battle and that's what this presentation is going to teach you about. Okay, as far as learning outcomes go, there's quite a few from this, but they're all very brief. The workshops will go into these learning outcomes in more detail. So really I'm just going to describe what an infection is, illustrate how the spread of infection can be prevented, distinguish the characteristics of patients who are more prone, define the link between commensal flora, and then we're going to look at the problem of antimicrobial resistance, particularly looking at Western Europe. Okay. So I'm sure you think you know, but do you know, what is an infection? Okay, here's a lovely definition here, but the most important word in it is pathogenic. Okay, you've got plenty of microorganisms, as I just said, which act as part of your commensal flora. Those microorganisms can become pathogenic if they get into somewhere they shouldn't do. So for instance, there's a lot of staphylococci that live on your skin. If you cut your skin, they get inside, get into the dermis, the lower parts of the skin, even into the bloodstream then, that gives you a problem. They can, if they get into the bloodstream, they can go anywhere around the body, could cause endocarditis, really severe disease of the heart tissue. So what we really want is to maintain the status quo between the microbes and us as humans. Okay, so basically said, what do you need for an infection? You need an organism that causes the infection and a host. Okay, if it gets in the wrong place, the organism will cause an infection. You've got a lovely little infected ulcer there on somebody's leg. Oops, jumping it forward a little bit there, getting a bit happy. Um, so what do you need for an infection? Okay, still need the organism and host, but the host has a lot of natural defences. You've got your physical barriers, you've got your skin, got lysozymes in your eye, okay, in your sputum. You've got the pH of the stomach itself, so that normally, you know, lyses quite a lot of bacteria or virus. Then you've got phagocytosis, your natural killer cells, okay, your neutrophils, your macrophages and your tissues. And after that you've got your humoral response, your complement and your plasma proteins. What you've got to know is that an infection doesn't always cause a disease as such. Okay, so you could have a very minute skin infection, a pimple for instance. That's not really causing a disease if you've got one. It's only when it becomes a bit of a problem you start to get acne that that's a disease itself. 
Okay, so one thing you'll learn about me is I love a bit of history, and this chap, Celsus, uh, was a Roman. And what did the Romans ever teach us? Well, they actually taught us the four clinical signs of an infection, which are rubo, cala, dolor, and tumor. Okay, if you know your Latin, you'll know what they are. For, for those of you who don't, rubo uh, is actually redness, it's not heat. Okay, calo is heat, dolor is pain, and tumor is swelling. Okay, so if you think about what tumor actually is, that's the swelling on a joint. And they're the four chief signs of any infection in a human. But it's not quite as simple as that. Okay, so this should say infection or inflammation, when it says infection or inflammation. Okay, which I say deliberately, okay, because you probably had inflammation there first, but the sign that actually shows it's infected is this kind of yellow stuff here. So that's pus, which is the localized sign of infection itself. Okay, however, this chap, Okay, he's got a little bit of swelling, he's got a bit of redness or erythema as we refer to it. I'm quite sure it's quite painful, okay, and quite hot to the touch. Okay, but this guy's actually got gout, okay, which is not an infective condition, it's an inflammatory condition. Okay, so a fairly mild case of gout, no sign of infection. So we need to look a little more deeply at what's going on in an infection. Okay. So all the signs on the left are things that can happen in inflammation. On the right, they're the four main causes of infection. We have to remember on the right as well is we also have the prions, which are small protein-like particles, which can cause variant Creutzfeldt Jakob disease or mad cow disease in cows. Okay, and a lot of the signs on the left can actually predispose patients to infection, okay? So if you have quite severe burns, that uh, breaks down the barriers in the skin, allows opportunistic pathogens to get in, cause an infection. Same goes for frostbite, okay, physical injury itself, so if you cut your arm open again, you're much more likely to have an infection, okay. Ionising radiation works slightly differently because that knocks out your immune system, okay, and that allows and um, bacteria, viruses, fungal, protozoal, parasites to actually get into your body and cause an infection. Okay, so the signs of infection can be divided up into two main classes. So your systemic classes are you get fever, high temperature, may get a bit of a tachycardia, fast heart rate, um, and in blood tests we'd look for things like white cell count, increased CRP or C-reactive protein, it's a generic sign of inflammation but it's often increased in infection, and increased erythrocyte sedimentation rate or ESR again can be raised in infection or inflammatory. So these last two here are kind of non-specific, okay, but most of the time you'd see increase in white cell count and increase in fever, but not every case. However, local things, if you've got a chest infection, you'll cough up some lovely sputum, which will be quite prurulent or thick, maybe coloured yellow or green. You can get local erythema, so if you cast your mind back to that picture before, you've got a lot of redness around the area, which is kind of the inflammatory response in the body. You can have the presence of pus, all right, which is made up of all dead white cells, dead matter from the bacteria or the viral infection itself. Okay, and a local one, a lot of people get urinary tract infections, so you may get pain on urination, which is otherwise known as dysuria. There's lots of other different local signs of infection, so say you have meningitis, you start to get a headache, you get photosensitivity to light, and it's all related to where the infection actually is in the body itself. Okay, looking at a few different signs, okay, we can divide them up into clinical signs, Okay, a lot of elderly patients tend to get confused, children can become irritable, so they might not be able to tell you about the actual, you know, signs of infection, they might not be able to tell you they're dizzy, but you'd actually see these other signs in elderly people. Okay, and again, the biochemical results, one more that I didn't mention before is the neutrophils, okay, they're almost like your first line defence um, of your white cells, so there's a lot of them circulating around in your blood anyway, but they'd increase if there was a locus of infection. Okay, 
when we're talking about infections, you've all heard of antibiotics, antivirals, antifungal, all formulated into many different things, okay? But the one basic rule when we're talking about clinical infections, I can't get this across strongly enough, is prevention is better than cure, all right? Just don't get an infection in the first place. Wash your hands after you've gone to the toilet. If you don't do that, you're going to increase your risk of infections, okay? It was around 2000 or so, the BMJ said what was the greatest medical advance since 1840, okay? And what did they vote for? Okay, this lovely picture here, okay? This is the London sewer system. Um, sanitation is the most important thing uh, when relating to infections. Physicians, surgeons, pharmacists, nurses, we can't do our job well without appropriate sanitation. It just makes life so much harder. Before the London sewer system, people died of cholera in London, things like diphtheria, um, and it's all related to poor social circumstances. So if we can prevent infections by actually, you know, massive building projects like sewerage systems, then we actually have a much more healthy population. That's why in kind of resource deprived areas, so like the Andes in South America, parts of India, Southeast Asia, there's a great more risk from infection there. People die of things like TB and polio in those areas. So the best thing you can do is prevent an infection. Secondly to that, Okay, any prevention campaign aims to reduce the transmission of microbes and you should all remember this from your basic microbiology and your immunology. But there's a few routes of transmission that you have. So they're the three main direct routes. You can have the fecal oral route. So if you don't wash your hands after going to the toilet and then start to try and get something out of your teeth, you're going to get a nasty case of gastroenteritis. Worst case scenario, you could get polio or cholera really not something you want. Kissing droplet spread, so things like glandular fever, colds are spread that way, okay, through droplets coming out of people's noses. And of course sexual transmitted disease is quite a big problem. You obviously need some quite direct contact to contract one of those. However there's a lot of indirect routes and diseases that are actually spread by indirect routes are often more infectious and have much greater potential for epidemics and pandemics so you've got either vehicle transmitted which can be food or water things like hepatitis are transmitted in water vector transmitted diseases so those are things like malaria is probably the worst vector transmitted disease that we deal with in the uk so that's carried by animals or insects okay and then airborne transmission so you have things like uh, influenza which is you know quite easy to catch when you're in a pandemic situation so any prevention campaign wants to reduce this so as you can see you know you've probably seen all these clean your hands coughs and sneezes cause diseases and as you can see there you've got all the little droplets and airborne particles coming out of that gentleman's nose it's why people tend to not like you coughing over each other um, it's actually related to the basic medicine and how people catch diseases. Okay, one of the greatest drugs we have is vaccination. Okay, they're not something you come across that often in community pharmacy, but they are the most useful tool in the fight against infections. And there's been a lot of bad press in recent years. And because of that, the vaccination rate has dropped in the UK. So this um, last kind of line here, herd immunity, oops, sorry, cross through it, I meant to circle it. It's very important, okay? Herd immunity is actually where a given proportion of the population, it's normally around 90% or so, okay? Um, actually, if you 90% of a population are vaccinated, the other 10% won't get the infection because the infection can't transmit from people. Normally 90 to 95%. Okay. The problem we've had in the UK recently is the vaccination coverage has dropped below that. And so there's been sporadic outbreaks of vaccine preventable diseases. So things like measles uh, and pertussis are probably the most common diseases that have spread quite frequently in recent years. So pertussis is the other name for whooping cough. 
Right? Countless lives have been saved before the mass vaccination programs. People died of things like diphtheria, tetanus, whooping cough, measles. People were scarred for life from polio. They became uh, paralysed. All right. It's an incredible success of the medical profession vaccination. Okay, smallpox was eradicated in the 1970s, and we're getting tantalizingly close to eradicating poliomyelitis. Uh, when I did a bit of research on this last year, there were only three countries with wild polio transmission, um, which were Nigeria, I think Somalia, and Pakistan. Unfortunately, um, political problems in those areas has reduced the vaccination coverage and it is starting to spread to, back to other nations in the region but I can't tell you enough vaccinations are really good um, the link between MMR and autism was totally disproved and the doctor that wrote that paper was actually struck off so if anything as a community pharmacist your main job is to actually convince people that it's really important for the children to have vaccinations any kind of side effects to get a little bit of a headache, a bit of a cold, is much better than the diseases themselves because people have actually forgot how dangerous measles is, how dangerous pertussis is. Okay, so if we can't prevent it, we have to treat an infection. And there's really two basic steps to that. You need to know something about your book. Is it a bacteria? Is it a virus? Is it a fungi? What sort of bacteria is it? And something about your patient, are they young or old, etc. Why do you need to know something about your patient? Well, actually, it's really important to know how susceptible they are to an infection. And all the factors that increase the risk of infection are a surrogate measure of the strength of a patient's immune system. So if someone's very young or old, their immune system tends not to work as effectively as that of someone of a peak age in the 20s and 30s. They have comorbidities such as diabetes or HIV, they actually increase the risk of infection. Diabetes slows down the repair process following an infection. Pharmacological therapy can have a big impact, so you've got drugs like corticosteroids, the DMARDs that are used in rheumatoid arthritis, immunosuppressant agents, cytotoxics for cancer. They all reduce a patient's immune response, and because of that, an infection is much more likely to take hold in that patient. Okay, also the vaccination history, obviously that has a bearing on whether someone's gonna get an infection or not. Also, if someone's had a previous or current infection, all right, this is a problem with opportunistic pathogens. So the easiest example I can think of is someone has the flu, that tends to affect the epithelial layer in the lungs itself and tends to destroy quite a few of the cells, causing a few you know, breakdowns in the mucous membrane barrier in the lung. What can happen there is you can get an opportunistic infection like Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Okay, uh, that's a particularly nasty bug, it's very difficult to treat. Um, and it causes quite severe pneumonia and that would be a secondary infection to the flu and that tends to be what kills patients with the flu virus it's not the flu itself it's actually the secondary infection okay so the basics of treatment is you look for the signs and symptoms of the infectious disease you pick an anti-infective agent or an antimicrobial agent you have to think about Will the microbial agent get to the site of action? What are the side effects like? Is it worth it? And ideally, that will resolve the infection. And we monitor the patient for the vital signs, the white cell count, the clinical presentation, any fever, to see if an infection has been resolved. Okay, so I mentioned this before. Are bacteria a friend or a clue? Bacteria are not often pathogenic. Often they're commensal. However, where they are commensal, if there's a site of infection in that location or, you know, a breakdown in the layer, so for instance a cut on the skin, it may often be a commensal bacteria from an area local to that that's causing the infection. Okay, so one of the most common locations of infection will be uh, the skin and there's a lot of staphylococci there particularly Staphylococcus aureus, okay, which is more commonly known as 
Well, more famous as Mephicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA. So they're very often implicated in skin infections like cellulitis. Because of that, we use a drug which normally kills Staphylococcus. So we use penicillins, Staphylococci are gram positive bacteria. Penicillins attack the cell wall, uh, basically punch holes in it. They're a really useful drug for that. Okay, penicillins are slightly less useful for treating UTIs because they're often caused by Escherichia coli. All right, the most common cause of UTIs is not wiping from front to back, so there becomes a bit of a bacterial contamination of the urethra. Okay, often it can be Escherichia coli. Okay, so basically how we treat an infection is we use what's called empirical therapy, which is when we take an educated guess about the bug, and that's based on the common locations. So you guess at the most likely pathogens, you'll normally take into account local policies and guidelines because resistance in one part of the country may be different to other parts. Okay, so you may have a lot of trimethoprim resistant E. coli in Stoke and because of that you may use a cephalospore to treat a UTI instead. Okay, the answers that you'll need are all at the front of section 5 of the BNF so that gives you empirical therapy for almost every infection you can possibly conceive of. Okay, what we like to do is we like to take cultures and sensitivities if possible to see whether an infection needs treating and that's basically where you take a swab or a sample of infected fluid from the area and try and grow it on an agar plate and see what you grow but obviously that takes at least a couple of days a patient may die in a couple of days from an infection so often we need to use this almost blind approach to antibiotic treatment okay the problem with that though, especially if we use a lot of what are called broad spectrum antimicrobials, so antimicrobials like amoxicillin that treat a wide spectrum of bacteria, is it can cause resistance, okay? And if we over prescribe antimicrobials, use them to treat viral infections, use them at doses which are too low, that increases the risk of antimicrobial resistance. The biggest problem, actually, is in reality 50% of antibiotics have been used in agriculture often used as growth promoters so the EU banned that in 2005 but we're still living with the consequences so for instance you know we've used things like enrefloxacin which is a quinolone in chickens and because of that if you get a campylobacter all right um, it is a hygiene tip for you Every chicken in the UK is pretty much contaminated with a bacteria called Campylobacter jejuni. So if you don't cook it properly, that will give you quite a nasty gastroenteritis, diarrhea and vomiting. Okay, but most of those species of Campylobacter are resistant to quinolones because of the amount that we used in chickens and the bacteria are actually selected for resistance evolved that way. Okay two ways that bacteria develop resistance okay clinically if you don't have enough or microbiology microbiological if it's intrinsic okay that's actually because the penicillin itself or any other kind of antimicrobial doesn't work against the bacteria so for instance penicillins aren't use, as useful at treating gram negative bacteria because the cell wall is different to gram positive that's called intrinsic resistance. Acquired resistance, on the other hand, may be mediated by plasmid transfer, conjugation, or by you know mistakes in the replication process to actually code for something like a beta-lactamase, which will break down the beta-lactam ring of um, beta-lactam antibiotics, so your penicillins, cephalosporins, your uh, carbapenems. Okay, Ronnie talks a lot more about that in the pharmacology, so I will not cover that here. Okay, so there are all the different mechanisms of resistance that bacteria can develop. Okay, current threats, all right, you've probably all heard of MRSA, you've probably heard of Clostridium difficile. Okay, you might not have heard of multidrug resistant Clevicella pneumoniae and the carbapenemase producing enterobacteriaceae. 
the problem is, is these three at the top, we're actually running out of antibiotics to treat them. Okay, MRSA, we can often treat with vancomycin or tankoplanin, unless it's the vancomycin resistant strain, VRSA. Um, and resistance isn't just a problem with bacteria, so you get artemisin in resistant plasmodium falciparum, which is responsible for malaria. We don't have anything to treat that, you know. And it's really scary if you think that we could go back to a time. If we didn't have antibiotics, we wouldn't be able to do a lot of routine surgery, so things like hip replacements wouldn't be possible because of the risk of infection. Bowel surgery would be pretty much impossible. So, you know, we really have to get this under control. It's a big, you know, government scheme. We have uh, started in 1998, but currently we're living under the next five year plan for dealing with the threat of antimicrobial resistance and so a 2013 to 2018 resistance strategy. That uh, forms part of the government uh, UK response to resistance. Okay. Just looking at this, this is carbapenemase producing Enterobacter. So carbapenems, things like imipenem, meropenem are pretty much the domestos of antibiotics that we've got. But if you'll see here, since 2008, there's a bit of an exponential growth in these carbapenemase producing Enterobacteriaceae that are totally resistant to every antibiotic we have. It's a problem. It's only gonna get worse over time. Just looking at multidrug resistant Cladicella here, okay, so all the countries with the red, um, so places like Italy down here, okay, Bulgaria where Sunny Beach is, okay, don't catch an infection in Sunny Beach, I think that's the moral of this story, and Greece, they're all 25 to 50% of their Cladicella pneumoniae, gram negative bacteria, um, are resistant, okay, in the UK, an island over here, we're not too bad, but this was 2010, 2013, pictures got a little bit worse, okay, so Poland's obviously got a problem, more than 50% resistance, and a lot more of the countries of so like kind of central, eastern Europe, so Croatia, Hungary, uh, Czech Republic, a couple of the Baltic states are starting to report problems, and even in western Europe, you know, France, Spain and Portugal, 10 to 25% resistant. Okay, and that's Clevicella. It is susceptible to carbapenems at the moment, this form. So this is just uh, the quinolones, the cephalosporins, the penicillins, but it's actually spreading. So what can we do? How can we reduce resistance? So what we talk about is antimicrobial stewardship, and this applies to antibiotics, antifungals, antivirals, antiparasitic agents. Basically there's three main concerns. So you've got to optimise the therapy for individual patients, in other words use the right drug for the right bug, prevent any overuse, misuse and abuse of antimicrobials. So we have quite a good um, you know, system for antibiotics in the UK. We don't sell very many of them from chemists at all, whereas in Eastern Europe where we've got all these problems over here, okay, the actual regulation of antibiotics, you can buy them over the counter in the pharmacies, patients can demand them much more easily than in the UK. Okay, and the third topic is to minimise the development of resistance at a patient and community level. And there's a lot of, you know, all this kind of resistance reporting, all the strategies in place from the government. There's two major ones that we use, one for primary care, one for secondary care. These all help minimise resistance. Okay. So really these are a little bit more, so if we're looking at, you know, reserving antimicrobials for those who need them, so not people with coughs and colds, sore throats, etc. As a pharmacist, we can advise on correct doses, durations, okay, so UTIs, if they're uncomplicated, you want to treat them for three days rather than seven, okay. Trying to get cultures and sensitivities more often and targeting narrow spectrum antimicrobials rather than the big broad spectrum ones. Okay, and then reducing inappropriate IV prescribing. So that's very much an issue in hospitals. So I always want a review after 48 hours of any IV prescription in a hospital. <coughs> what that does is reduce the infection risk because giving someone a drip 
is an infection risk. You've got a cannula going directly into their veins, okay, which is a nice way of bacteria for getting into the veins and then causing sepsis. Okay, but also if their infection is resolving, they can actually tolerate oral therapy. We're better off treating them with that rather than with highly potent intravenous antibiotics. Okay, you've probably seen all these in your local GP. This is kind of like a bit of an education campaign and it's really important to educate the public. Often if patients go to a GP they're expecting a prescription for antibiotics if they have a bit of a chest infection but often even you know bacterial chest infections don't always require antibiotics and there's very little evidence to say whether antibiotics actually improve the you know the course of a bacterial chest infection so even looking at those um, there's a case for not prescribing antibiotics for reserving them for when people actually need them okay there's a lot of other ways there of reducing resistance so in primary care there tends to be something called the target antibiotics which is basically treating antibiotics with respect um, whereas in secondary care we have something called start smart then focus um, which is a way of picking the right antibiotic and making sure that patients you know receive antimicrobial therapy when they need it but not a danger to themselves okay so you might be thinking this and this is probably what every primary care practitioner is thinking in the UK is does it have an effect okay I need to treat a patient who is very poorly with an antibiotic why should I you know let it carry on for a couple of days and risk their wrath um, and you know actually risk the infection getting worse so does it have an effect okay these are the MRSA rates for 2010 uh, in the European Union so you can see got quite a lot of red which is a uh, 25 to 50 percent MRSA out of all Staphylococcus aureus so it tends to be a problem in southern Europe but also northern Europe 10 to 25 percent in Great Britain it's only really Scandinavia Holland where we've got really low rates of MRSA and in Portugal there's a place you don't want to get a skin infection more than 50% MRSA there by 2013 though there's a lot more orange on the map so actually we've kind of reduced um, the cases of MRSA in Spain okay it's actually a lot more in the 10 to 25% range which is good the cases we have a problem now at the little island of Malta and Romania okay uh, Scandinavia Holland still seems to be doing quite well which is good so actually you know MRSA is probably the first bacteria that we targeted with antimicrobial stewardship so hopefully in you know five to ten years time those cleddy cellographs that I showed you earlier in the presentation won't be as bad as they are now okay so just a summary what you need to know about infections prevent an infection before curing it that's always the best thing you can do antibiotics antimicrobials are not always the answer often infections will resolve the self-limiting patients will use you know rely on their own immune system and get better after a week or two you need to know if you're going to treat it know something about the bug know something about the patient okay you'll often use empirical therapy where you've got to guess what kind of bug it is okay the duration of treatment and the route of administration depend on the severity of the infection so say you've got a bone infection you may often need six weeks of therapy for that because it's really difficult to get the antibiotic to the bone itself okay if you're very poorly in hospital with pneumonia you're likely to need IV antibiotics if you've got a lower respiratory tract otherwise known as a pneumonia in the community you know you still walk you walk into a GP surgery it's very unlikely you need IV antibiotics okay and the last one preventing the spread of resistance will be a huge challenge in 21st century healthcare and the big challenge is education it's education of the public it's education of professionals as professionals we often go into these careers looking to help people and you know antibiotics are one of the few drugs that actually cure 
people of a disease, okay? All the drugs for cardiac problems, all the drugs for things like Crohn's disease, for peptic ulcers, they only really palliate the condition, they don't actually cure it. All the drugs for diabetes, you're on them for life. So actually there's a big temptation there to prescribe an antibiotic. You've cured someone, you've helped them, you feel good about themselves, they feel good about themselves. But actually, we're increasing this risk of resistance and future generations may not have the luxury of that choice. So it's really important to get that across to professionals, but also get it out there to the public that often, you know, it may be irritating having a chest infection, but often you can still work with a couple of days rest, you'll be back to normal. So that is the most important thing you've got to do as future pharmacists. Thank you very much.